Hi, welcome back to today's episode of the Lady Landlords podcast. Today, we are speaking with Colin from Atlas Property Management, all about making sure that you ladies find the best property manager for your needs. So Colin, thank you for joining me today. I appreciate you being on. I'm super excited to be here, Becky. I know we've had some good chats in the past, so I want to see how I can help out all the lady landlords out there. Yes, I actually was on Colin's podcast um, a couple months ago, so I will make sure to link that episode down in the show notes as well, so we can have some of our listeners come over and hear that episode too. But so, Colin, fill me in. Where where in the world are you? Tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, so we are Atlas Property Management. We are located in the Kansas City area is where we're doing our managing right now. We are hoping soon to be opening up our St. Louis office, as well as looking at uh, the markets in Ohio as well. So those are coming here pretty quickly. So where we are is Kansas City now, where we're going, who knows? <laughs> so and that's actually good to know. I'm glad to hear that you're, you're expanding and opening into new markets. That's very exciting news. Now, how did you end up in property management? I'm pretty sure when I was a kid and we had like career day, you know, I only got like firemen and nurses. We didn't really get <laughs> the, uh, the property managers coming, coming to my school. So how did you end up in property management? Well, I didn't aspire to be a property manager uh, like you. So my educational background is engineering. I did a lot of construction, project management, project engineer uh, related stuff, working for general contractors and subcontractors. And then uh, I started reading some books. I started getting interested, uh, interested in investing in real estate. I, you know, I read what I call the gateway drug uh, to real estate yeah. investing, rich dad, poor dad. And uh -huh. that really was my paradigm shift. Uh, as I was under contract to buy my first uh, seven unit building, my first investment, uh, I got fired from my engineering job. And I just kind of said, you know what? I'm not going back. I didn't like the corporate world. It wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I kind of took off from there and started buying assets by myself with partners. And I was, I didn't have a job. All my partners did. So I was the guy that was managing it. And I was like, you know what? I should look at just starting a property management company and recapture some of this revenue that I'm leaving on the table and maybe I can systematize, maybe I can grow it into a business and, you know, I can have other people do the, take the maintenance calls and not me. And so that's yeah. kind of how it got started. That's awesome. So then I want to talk a little bit more about like you actually just starting off as that investor. So at that time you had no, you were then really self-managing your own properties. Correct. Yeah. hundred percent. Right? And was that something that then just, I'm sure some of our ladies would be interested in kind of hearing about how some of those deals were structured, right? You're talking about how the other people now had that full-time W-2 kind of job. Mm -hmm. you, and I don't think you got fired. It sounds like you quit when they told no, you. No, I got, fired. I got fired, but then I, <laughs> I, no, no, no bones about it. I got, I got let go. Uh, I just decided not to go back. You decided not to go back. Yeah. I love that. Um, but once again, you said it's not a good fit for you. That, that yeah. whole corporate world wasn't your thing anyways. Right. So, and I'm totally the same way. So I agree with, I understand what you mean by that, but when you then decided, kind of set up the structure to be able to buy properties, was part of your deal then that you would be the property manager, like in turn for, for then your partners kind of using their W-2 to you know, have some benefit there? Was that something that you took into consideration? Yeah, I was giving myself a small fee, uh, less okay. than what I would charge now. I was taking 5%. Again, we are in a different market than maybe New York mm -hmm. where 5%, I'd take that all day in, in, uh, in New York rents. Uh, but no. Yeah, just, just based upon uh, where we were at, I decided to take 5% because I had equity in the deal as well. So I was banking on that as well. Gotcha. So that was actually, that's a nice structure. I like that. That you, mm -hmm. I feel like that's something that our ladies can realize that it doesn't have to always be this like 50-50, like perfect equity split, or it doesn't yeah. have to be, well, you put in a hundred grand, I put in a hundred grand. That's how we're going to buy this property. Mm -hmm. That there are different ways that you can kind of get creative with it and managing those properties or then them starting a property management company is a good way to also have that extra benefit in your, in your own portfolio. Yeah, absolutely. So some of them I own hundred percent myself. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them I had 50, 50 partnership with, and some of them, if we just like start really stacking that first company that I was 50, 50 in, we then mm -hmm. took a third of another deal. So we had, so I only had like half of a third <laughs> <laughs> of ownership in that, but then I was also doing the managing. So yeah, it doesn't have to be necessarily 50, 50. And, you know, I mean, as on those LLCs, I was put as the manager. So I was responsible for all the operations, um, you know, but I did, I didn't do it for free. No, and you shouldn't, and I'm no. glad you didn't. And then also, once again, this at the time, it ended up being almost that extra income stream in the mm -hmm. sense that, you know, you had 
a third of the deal that you had 50, that you had 50% of, right? So now you were able to find a way to then add an extra income stream by managing that property of that deal, even though it wasn't one that you'd specifically owned 100% of. Correct. And then that even turned into a larger income stream now with Atlas Property Management. Mm -hmm. So kind of cool. Yeah, it is. It's, it's pretty cool <laughs> the way it's all evolved. And, uh, you know, we, we found a niche um, I, and, and when we started it and said, well, let's continue to work this niche that we're in and it started growing and then it just it kind of took off from there. Now, here we are. Now, here we are. So I feel like when a lot of people get involved in owning rentals or kind of in this landlording world, they kind of end up falling on one of two sides, either like, yep, I like being a landlord. This kind of works for me. Or then saying, nope, actually, this is what I want to outsource. This is actually what the property management is the piece that I didn't want to do. So did you then realize that you were the person that actually enjoyed being a landlord and said, how can I kind of do this more? Or was it just something that once again, with your background that you were like, I get this, this makes sense. Let's go this direction. I've kind of always had an entrepreneurial itch even before I, I, I got into real estate. Um, and, you know, deciding to start the property management company, I can't say that I was like overly qualified at the time, other than I made a lot of mistakes on my own properties. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have to feeling there's some good stories in there. So <laughs> always, always good stories. <laughs> so feel free to share them um, kind of as we go throughout this today. But what was now being on the other side with this is such like a, a large business and a, a large income stream for you, then what, what types of people would you say mostly come to you looking for property management services? Yeah. So there's generally two types and we have an interesting demographic and that 95% of our owners are out of state owners. Okay. Right. There is, if I guess, you know, if I'm just going to, let me go overly simplistic. There's more money on the coasts and in Chicago and Texas than there is in the Midwest, but there's yields in the Midwest. So money is flowing from out of state into state mm -hmm. uh, in here. So 95 plus percent of our investors are out of state investors. So, you know, that's who's coming to us. A lot of them want to do value add. Well, we also provide construction services given my background. I've also brought a partner on. We both did engineering school together. We both have a construction background. So that was kind of how we got to the point where we were saying, okay, well, what kind of investor do we want to target? And it's an out of state investor. And a lot of time it's a value add investor. And mm -hmm. then the other type is, Hey, I've been self-managing this property. I'm not happy with the result. I'm self-managing the property from out of state. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not happy with the result. I mean, we've got one guy and, you know, he's trying to do it from Hawaii and we're in Kansas city. And like, you know, great. He's, he's been doing a pretty good job, but I think he's just kind of tired of, of the brain damage right now. So yeah, he's, he's bringing us on. Good. And also with that time difference too, mm -hmm. I feel like that would just be, I mean, people are, I feel like if a tenant had an issue, they're calling rather early. Um, yes. Hawaii time to complain about something. And I don't know about anybody else, but I, there's nothing I like less than waking up in the morning, having a bunch of messages from angry people. Mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> right? That's not, not really how well I like to start my day. So yeah. I can't imagine what that would be like, but so the, I love the fact that you guys offer that construction services and as a person that owns in state and out of state, like that, that makes perfect sense to me. I, I like the fact that you guys added that. Is that something that you would say is normal for property managers to offer that construction service? So it's kind of a hybrid question. Uh, In-house construction, no. Willing to project manage a third party uh, contractor, yes, for an additional fee. So, of course. So that was actually, go ahead. Oh yeah, so I mean, the, the way uh, any business has worked is, you know, you got your cost, you put a margin on there, right? So mm -hmm. let's just, let's just make an easy number, right? It's a $20,000 project. The general contractor is going to put a 10% markup on it, $22,000. Well, then along comes your property manager who you're paying to project manage, construction manage. Well, they're going to put another 10 to 12% on top of that. So you're paying double markup on that. So we eliminate that and we say, okay, here's the construction cost. It's all internal. Property management's not marking you up. When we're done, we hand it off to we hand it off to operations essentially. Gotcha. All right. So this actually, I'm happy you actually answered the question that way because that's going to lead into my next question. Do can you just run down what some of the normal services are for a property manager? I feel like there seems to be a little confusion on if a property manager is going to come in and place a tenant and then just kind of peace out and not mm -hmm. help with anything else. 
if they're going to stay there and then are they doing the actual work? If the tenant calls and complains about something, are they hiring somebody else? What types of services? And then does it become more of an a la carte menu here mm -hmm. that a owner like myself can kind of pick off of and kind of say like, oh, I want, I want you to do everything. I want you to oversee everything. I want you to be there for everything. I'm just going to write the check or, and, or versus a, the option of, hey, I'm actually want my guys, I want my people to be there and those types of things. Can you kind of mm -hmm. walk me through how a property manager would set up their services and offerings? Yeah. So I think there's going to be generally kind of two camps that you'll see. At least this is my experience. Other companies I know get more creative with the pricing structure and oh, there's a basic and a, a mid-range and a premium property management. But we try to keep it simple. And most of my C is simple. If you want us to do just lease up on your property and you self-manage, we will do that. We will collect our fee. It will be a larger fee than if we manage your property. But we'll get our fee. Of we'll course. do it for you. We'll hand it over to you, back over to you with a signed lease, but you're signing the lease, not us. <laughs> um, second is what I will call full service property management. So we'll do mm -hmm. all leasing. We'll do operational management. We'll handle maintenance calls and we'll take care of evictions and then we'll release the property. Or if it comes vacant, we'll, you know, oversee a turn, maybe send maintenance guys in there to turn it. So then dividing that down further is, do they have their own internal staff or is it all third con, you know, third party or subcontractors? We do 80% of our work with our own internal staff. I know a mm -hmm. gentleman out of Texas runs a very successful property management company and he does all his maintenance um, with subs. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So then that's, so really then it, in a lot of these different situations, the owner is able to kind of pick and choose a little bit more of what they need and have to still have kind of that control over what that relationship would look like. A little bit. I'm, I'm really going to say there's going to be kind of two options. If you're coming for a property manager, you're going to get lease up or you're going to get full service. I don't think gotcha. any property manager is going to say, Hey, you know, I'll do your lease up. I'll do your rent collection, but you're handling maintenance. Like, I don't think that's going to happen. I would never allow that to happen because that just throws a wrench. Because whoever signs the lease is on the hook for operational deficiencies. So if I sign the lease, but then you're taking too long to coordinate maintenance, I could get sued. Exactly. They're going to come back and people are going to start complaining to you. And once again, yeah. the point of the property manager is to really kind of be that first line of contact. So now you're going to get all the complaints for the things that I didn't necessarily do. Exactly. The reason that you're hiring a property manager, and if I can just, yeah, the way I tell this to people is if you get an accountant to do your taxes, do you mm -hmm. tell them how to do your job, their job? Do you question their decision? <laughs> do you question how they're doing what they're doing? Generally, no, because, you know, well, hey, we just don't understand it. But, you know, you're trusting them to do the right thing. If you're hiring a property manager, you know, you trust them to do what they're doing because they're going to take that headache off of your plate because you either, A, don't know how to do it, don't have the bandwidth to do it, or don't want to do it. Now, obviously, yeah. like with any other professional service, if they're not meeting your standards, you can fire them come back to them and say, Hey, you're not doing this well. Let's get this back together or else it's, I'm going to pick somebody else. Like those are all conversations you can have with, with them as a professional, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, you're paying them to do their job and, you know, let them, let them do their job. And my goal at Atlas is for your passive mm -hmm. investment to be passive. I want you to get yeah. your PL statement or your income statement with your check deposited automatically of course mailbox money no we want just bank account money but <laughs> you, get the, you get that money and a report once a month if you have any questions you reach out otherwise just let it go and trust exactly. us that you know we obviously have to build trust and we understand that that's not earned on day one but our goal is for it to be a passive investment for you exactly and i think that's what a lot of people then struggle with is what is like how to make sure that they're going to find somebody that actually is a good property manager, mm -hmm. you know, and what I completely agree and believe in the idea that experts should be allowed to be experts, right? If, if that's what you do and that's what your expertise is in great, that's not what my expertise is in. We need to then be able to give the experts the room to be able to do their job. Just mm -hmm. like you said, I'm not going to tell my accountant how to do my taxes because I'm pretty sure there was a reason I was hiring her in the first place. Right. So what are what are some signs of knowing if a property manager is a good property manager versus a bad property manager before I hire you? Like, how am I supposed to be able to kind of know what I'm getting myself into? Because then when you kind of get through that like sales period, everybody is always good. Everybody always yeah. knows what they're doing. You can always trust them. They're always going to do you right. And they're always going to tell you that everybody else isn't going to do you right. So what are some ways that we can kind of just know from the beginning if somebody's going to be a good property manager or not? Mm -hmm. I'm 
first and most easy one is to kind of research them online, mm-hmm. go to bigger pockets, uh, you know, see if they've got any sort of reputation online, you know, whether it's Facebook or Google, uh, check out their um, referrals, right? Ask for referrals, call them. I mean, obviously, yes. you know, I'm going to, I'm going to give somebody my best referrals. I'm not going to give them an unhappy customer, but you know, give them a referral, see how long the referral has been with them. Uh, you know, just, you know, it's really, it's more of a due diligence thing. Now I would say if they're saying that they're not using any PM software, they're all doing it by books. I'd say, well, might need to look into the way they're doing that. If it's all still an analog process. Um, That's a really good point. So one, I completely agree with you, like references, just how we would say, if we are already self-managing that you need to call um, the previous landlord, that you need to Mm -hmm. ask for references, just like you would also for a contractor or any other service provider. You want to make sure to kind of call those people and then make sure to be asking them questions about what their experience is like. So you kind of get that idea of what somebody else is doing and how the, how they're working together. Then I love the idea of actually asking what programs and software they're using. Mm-hmm. Because I agree. I, as an out-of-state investor, I would want to be able just to like hop on my computer. Like you said, just check my bank account, go be able to see what's kind of going on with like my property rather mm-hmm. than having to call and be like, oh, no, no, I just wrote it down on a piece of paper somewhere in my notes about what's going on with your property. That's not going to help me with you're in Kansas city and I'm here in New York. Mm -hmm. No, that's a, that's a hundred percent true. Um, you know, it's vetting. Anybody can be a challenging process, no matter what the service is. Uh, You Mm -hmm. really just have to feel like that you're going to be comfortable with their process and that the way they're, they're operating, you know, and figure out, I just ask them pointed questions. What do you do differently? What services do you provide? How do you operate your business differently than other property managers? That's going to, give me a tangible benefit. Who do I have access to call or to talk to if I have an issue or a question? Make sure you like like all those answers. Okay. I like that question about like asking who's the person you're supposed to be contacting. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's another question I see a lot in lady landlords is people not knowing exactly sure how they're supposed to interact with that property manager. A lot of them kind of just think, okay, well, I'm going to hire you. That's it. I'm going to talk to you once a year. We're just going to check in when leases are renewed. And that's kind of it. Is that normal? Or like what type of communication should I be seeing with my property managers? It is such a large spectrum that it is mm-hmm. very much what do, do, kind of communication do you want? Now, okay. there's going to be a couple things that are going to come into play with that. From the property manager standpoint, the more you own, the more attention we can give you. <laughs> the more money you're spend, we're spending with you. Yeah, it deserves because it's, it's more it's, of a white glove service. Well, that and it's even it's it's kind of very binary, and I, I don't want to sound callous about this, but let's say we're making, you know, our top line revenue from your property is a hundred dollars a month. Mm-hmm. Well, what is the bill rate for our property managers? How much time do they then have to spend on your property? Now, if you're bringing mm-hmm. in a thousand dollars a month, well, that's ten times more that we can spend, right? But if you are owning one single family house, and you want a one hour phone call once a month to discuss the status of your property, that doesn't make good financial sense for your property manager. Mm -hmm. Right now, of course, uh, during the initial startup phases, if you have questions or you bring a property manager in and the property's in disrepair, or you've got a tenant that's in arrears, there's some bumps to overcome, you know, more frequent communication can be expected. On Mm -hmm. our end, you know, the best way is just shoot an email to the property manager. Hey, I've got a question about this invoice. Why do I have a lawn mowing invoice? Right? <laughs> well, hey, it was mm-hmm. vacant. Somebody had to mow the lawn, right? Like it's, it could be something as simple as that. But if you like want to schedule and go back and forth and schedule a one hour call to discuss mm-hmm. one invoice and we're emailing back and forth to find a time, it just, it makes us, it makes it hard for us to make money. Yeah, and exactly. we want, we want, we have a vested interest in you making money because then we're going to make money. Selfishly, it's business, right? If, if we're able to raise your rent, rent, for you, if we're able to keep your property occupied and keep your collections up, the, the, our company is going to do better. But this is very much, it kind of reminds me of um, in other professions where there's kind of that serviced accounts, right? So mm-hmm. I, I've worked in pharmaceuticals now for about 15 years and some of the different clients that like we've worked with, it's interesting to see which type of company, you know, either gets to go, you know, box seats of the Yankees gets, you know, different, you know, when they come to town, these are the dinners that we're going to kind of take them to versus like a smaller account where it's like, okay, like this is what we're going to do with kind of this account. Mm -hmm. It is more of that client services. It is more of fulfilling and meeting kind of those different needs. And once again, the role is to make sure to be managing the property more than you're managing the owner. 
right? Yeah. So I see what you're saying, like to kind of then say, okay, well, for this allotted amount that we are making from this account, to be, we want to make sure that we're spending that with the time on the property that it's needed rather than just consistently updating and just kind of like calling the property manager and property owner saying like, hey, okay, so all's good on your property. I guess we'll talk next week. Yeah, exactly. We don't want to be micromanaged just like you don't want to be micromanaged. And yeah. that's, and you know, that, that that's kind of part of it as well is, uh, but yeah, no. And if you say, hey, you know, let's, if you want to shoot your property manager an email and say, hey, is everything good? Just want to double check. And, you know, they say, yeah, but a lot of the questions, if, you know, you go in and learn how to use the uh, owner portal on the PM software, a lot of those questions can be answered without you having to dig into it. You know, I've gotten a lot of yeah. emails from owners like, hey, can you give me this report? And I'm like, so then I'll do like a screen recording. I'm like, okay, here's how you can pull this report. So you don't have to ask me anymore. Yeah. And that's also, that makes good business sense on both sides, because then that's something they can just kind of do on their own. Now, once again, you're teaching them, right. How to fish here, how to go yes. find the information that they need. So then once again, you can be focused really on taking care of their property in the best situation that you can mm -hmm. now. And then also that kind of goes back to why I can see you saying it's a little worrisome for a property management company that doesn't have some of these systems set up because then there's no other way to disseminate that information mm -hmm. than to be constantly taking phone calls from owners about, Hey, how does this sound stand? Where does this stand? What's going on with this? Rather than being able to go, like you said, to like a portal mm -hmm. and have all the information there, all the updates needed and to be able to move on. Because I know yeah. I don't like, I don't like having to call customer service, right? I don't want to have to call and be like, Hey, how do I do this? What's the status of this? We don't like to do those. Nobody mm -hmm. likes to do that even for like, even outside of landlord and stuff. Right. Yeah. So it sounds like once again, if you can just show somebody where they can get that information, that seems like a better use of everybody's time. Yeah. But if the, if, you know, if somebody on our staff is not performing and they're the owners asking for stuff and they're not getting it, if they're shooting it via email, I say, copy their direct supervisor on it. Here's their email. If you're not getting what you need, roll up the food chain, right? I mean, there is, you know, yeah. it, it, you are entitled to get some stuff that you're asking for most of the stuff that you're asking for, um, you know, unless it's an inordinate amount of time. Uh, but mm -hmm. You know, we should be able to get you a report. We should be able to answer a question. If you feel like there was an error on an invoice that was input into your account, like you're, you're definitely should be able to get those answers. And, you know, we do provide the owners the, the ability to roll that uphill to until they get the answer they need. Now in your contract, would you say a lot of kind of, a lot of these things are actually like discussed, like through that really about like how to use the portal, that this is the option for that. Do you kind of have everything really laid out from the very beginning or some type of orientation for a, a owner to kind of know where they can find some of these things and once again, get them prepped to kind of be on their own then? Not yet. That is something okay. that we need to work on, uh, you know, and we're bringing on some, some uh, you know, a new leadership team, not uh, new to us. Not, we didn't have to get rid of anybody, but we're getting the size. Now okay. we're bringing in leadership team, bringing in, you know, a regional PM, uh, chief operating officer where my time won't be sucked up managing the employees as much. So then we can start to work on putting these, right. We've got some other things we want to put in place. Owner, like an owner training orientation video, same with the tenants. Hey, here's how you go in here. So you put in a maintenance request instead of just sending them a link that says, Hey, here's how you create your password. And then nothing else after that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That makes sense. Um, and I'm happy to hear that. So really, would you say though, that like most of the ways that you work with your with your owners would be through some type of contract agreement where it kind of really lays out, like, this is when you would expect to hear from us. This is, this is how this will work. These are the fees that are associated with things. Do you feel that like all of those things for a good PM should really be laid out in a contract? Yeah. Their property management agreement should, should have a lot of that information. Here's our standard fees. You know, anything else is going to cost this or it's a la carte, or it's going to be a per hour basis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe check to see their lease as well, because that's where we see a huge deficiency in um, mom and pop or non-professional operators is checking on okay. leases, right? Really? We take over properties where they've got a two-page lease <laughs> and there's so much exposure left for every party involved when those leases come through. Exactly. That's why I was actually asking about that because I feel like if I saw like a property management agreement that was like, you know, three quarters of a page and had no numbers on it or no fees, I'd be a little bit worried. Right. Yeah. So it sounds like I'm kind of on point with that. But then also yeah, ours is like 11 it, pages long. I would expect it to be about the same length as my lease, which I'm pretty sure is 10, probably 11 pages. Yeah. Long. So, and then same thing. So then you would expect same that lease to also just as much as I would want to have all my conditions understood with my property manager, I would then still want my tenants to then have that understanding 
with with their property manager. Yeah, so, absolutely. So I, I like that you just mentioned that leases are then signed with the property management company, not mm -hmm. with us as a landlord. Correct. So when then, so the, can you talk a little bit about how that kind of changes like the liability and also the responsibilities between the two parties? Mm -hmm. So the lease should state everything that, depending on the state or how the lease is written, the landlord or the manager is responsible for. And then it should state everything that the tenant's responsible for. At no point in our lease does it mention mm -hmm. property owner, right? It only, because that's a third party that's not involved. This is a transaction between the, a contract between the property management company and between the tenant. It's the owner has a contract with the property manager. So we are, we're the middleman. We are insulating you from as much risk as we can. We are mm -hmm. property managers carry their own insurance. They should be, you know, checking on tenant insurance. There's a lot of stuff that the PM company should be doing to, to insulate you from any potential issues, as well as preventative maintenance, um, you know, responding in a timely manner to maintenance calls, especially if they're health and safety related. Mm -hmm. those sort of things. I love the fact that you mentioned that property managers should have their own insurance. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that not a lot of people would think about, that that is, that once again, that you are that business that you are that that like you said kind of that middleman there so mm -hmm. that since that lease is with you that clearly you as a business entity would have your own insurance yeah absolutely love that um and not just other... not just one type of insurance we carry like four or five <laughs> different types of insurance <laughs> right i mean some of them are just like a general business liability but then there's the rest of them are fairly well um property management specific insurances I did not know that those that yeah. there were property management specific ones. Well, okay. A lot of a lot of professional industries will carry an ENO, errors and omissions, attorneys, yeah. accountants, engineers. We carry the same sort of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. There's anti discrimination insurance. Uh, there's you know electronic money theft insurance. There's there's a number of different types that we carry. Gotcha. Okay, so that's helpful to know from them that because I know once again a lot of our ladies are also looking for just making sure that they are protected. So that's great. So I'm really happy that you mentioned that property managers also call carry their own insurance. Mm -hmm. So here's one thing that I see all the time in lady landlords, which is one of the reasons that I wanted to make sure we got a property manager here on the podcast was a lot of times I'm hearing that landlords are getting called directly from tenants about, Hey, there's this problem with the property or this problem with the property. Can you walk me through then why, how many different red flags issues there would be? in that situation with a landlord getting a call from a toilet about a, a, from a tenant about a toilet or, or maintenance issue. So you're saying that an owner is getting the call mm -hmm. circumventing the property manager. Correct. <laughs> well, first, if you're not watching the YouTube and you're listening to the podcast, just know that Colin is looking at this. Like, I feel like his head is going to explode. Like what is going on with these other people's with in these other property management businesses? <laughs> so my first question is going to be, how did they get your phone number? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's one of two things. Either you used to self-manage it and you passed it on or else you as the owner thought it was a good idea to send a welcome packet or a welcome care package out of the goodness of your heart to the tenant and gave them your personal contact information. We never want tenants to get owner's contact information. The mm -hmm. only time we've had that as an issue, if it was when I used to be the property manager and I did everything myself and I owned the properties and I gave out my cell phone number. I stopped doing that mistake. Now I have finally redirected everybody to my PM team. Don't call me anymore. I'm not going to help you. We've got, right. we have an assigned property manager. We've told you that 10 times. Um, you know, we've had it happen one other time where a letter was sent to the ownership LLC uh, because of, um, you know, the neighbor sent it because we had just taken over the property and it was a large package. And like, as soon as that transaction happened, the neighbor found the ownership LLC and sent them a letter and was like, Hey, you've got drug dealers in here. And we're like, <laughs> okay, yeah, that's, that's good for us to know. Let's get them evicted as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, but you know, uh, uh, an owner should never get a phone call from a tenant. You should never give your cell phone to a tenant mm -hmm. because what you're doing is you're, you know, circumventing mommy to see if daddy gives you a different answer. Exactly. That tends to be a lot of the stories that I see in our post and lady landlords is mm -hmm. basically, basically the owner getting a phone call being like, well, 
the property manager didn't call me back fast enough. Or they're saying that, you know, the appliance was ordered, but it's not going to be here for two more days or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And then they're calling. And it's, I like the way that you phrase that because that's what they're doing. Now they're just running to mommy to see if they can get a different answer Mm -hmm. because they didn't like the one that they were already given. Yeah. And you know, we, as property managers, we have laws that we have to comply with and timeliness to repair certain items. Right. Yeah. And I'm sorry that your toilet's been leaking for five days. We have 30 days legally to repair it. We don't want to push the envelope. We want to do everything as promptly as possible. But if I have a water heater go out here or in a, pro- in a toilet go out here, this one's going to get us in trouble, right? Like an air conditioner, because that's a health and safety thing. And it's 95 mm-hmm. degrees outside versus a toilet that's costing you an extra $3 a, uh, a day in water. Right? Those, exactly. you know, those are the, and we don't want to say that no maintenance requests are, you know, not high priority, but the owner is not going to want us to spend overtime money that they have to pay for to go fix a leaking toilet, right? So now, you know, we we do prioritize based upon health and safety and who gets the request in first. Um, but you know, we also have the law states that we have X number of days to respond and X number of days to repair. And if we don't, then the tenant can withhold it from their rent. Like that's it's in Missouri at least. Um, that's the way all, that stuff's written. Exactly. No, that's, uh, once again, yes, this is a very good reminder, everybody, make sure to go check and follow your state laws. Yes. But um, what you mentioned in there about that overtime is one of the other things that I wanted to talk about. So here's now kind of second issue that I feel like I've seen in a lot of posts and lady landlords. Then is saying, okay, well now here I'm going and I'm, I'm hired, I hired this property manager. I'm now paying property manager, but now I'm getting a bill because there's a problem with the property. Makes sense. I get it. To me, that makes absolute sense. So can you walk me through how that would work with either money and reserves of that you would need to get started with either things for maintenance issues at my house or how those things are going to be taken care of or fixed as a property manager? Because then if a tenant calls you and say, hey, my toilet's leaking and you just are going to call me because the toilet's leaking, well, then I could have kind of done that myself. So Mm -hmm. fill us in on how that property manager saves me the headache of being that landlord in this situation. Mm -hmm. Well, our property management agreement is written with a number. If there is Mm -hmm. any decision that's going to be over $500, we're going to contact the owner to get owner approval unless it's health and safety. Then it's more of an informational. Hey, your water heater went out. It needs to be replaced. It's 20 years old. It's going to be $1,000. I'm sorry. Uh, Hey, there's uh, something broken in your air conditioner. We can replace it for $2,000. We can replace that part of the system for $2,000 or we can band-aid it for 300. Which do you want? It's more gotcha. of a notification that, hey, this is going to cost more than $500 or if it is going to cost more than $500, is there an option A, option B? Gotcha. Uh, but yeah, it, you, you should be laid out in your property management agreement that there is a maintenance spend threshold that the property manager just operates with outside of that. And have grace with the property manager because sometimes they get into stuff. Oh, great. I need to replace this shower faucet. No big deal. Take me two hours plus materials, $200. Well, they get out there and, oh, well, okay, it's not. I got to cut a hole in the drywall. I have to solder <laughs> pipes. I have to replace it. I have to patch the drywall. I have to mud the drywall. I have to let it dry. I have to sand it. Then I have to paint it. Now, we did that in a multi-unit complex and we were able to, you know, hit some other small tasks during that day, but our guy ended up being out there for 12 hours. So, you know, you still got to deal with the fact that somebody was on site for 12 hours and mm-hmm. yeah, it was a thousand dollars or whatever the number was to replace this. And it was $150 part. And we understand your frustration, but it's better than us making four trips out there. And in the end, that actually probably did save money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it did. It did because and, if you, you know, it depends on how your PM bills, but if they bill a show up fee every time, 50, 75 bucks, I don't know what it is, depending on the markets to show up, well, you're going to get hit with extra time. Exactly. And that is interesting because so a lot of people, when we talk about property managers, they usually just kind of talk about like this flat fee. You always kind of hear at least where I am, you kind of hear like somewhere between like an eight to 15% um, kind of fee for a property manager. But mm-hmm. That's to just kind of oversee and manage the property, right? That was kind of what we were talking about, like to get that setup fee. Then I feel like what a lot of people don't understand is that there are actually costs for different things that have to be done. Like you said, that that does not include fixing different items or for going out and sending a team to go fix something or replace a part. Mm-hmm. That is just the management fee itself to kind of get the ball rolling. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, just like every business, time is money. We have to have employees. We have overhead. Uh, you know, we've got an office, we've got 
managers. We've got all this sort of stuff. So mm-hmm. the, you know, depending on the property, the, the 80, the hundred, the $120 a month that we collect from your property. Well, mm-hmm. that doesn't cover our maintenance guy going out to your property that covers our direct costs, overhead and profit for the time yeah. invested in the scope of work that is outlined in the property management agreement. You want us to spend five hours working on an eviction for you. Well, and we have to go to court. There's, we have to recoup that person's time, right? Your, your bookkeeper is going to file your taxes for a flat fee, but if you want them to reconcile all your books, it's going to be a different fee. Exactly. Mm-hmm. No, and that's, I think that's really what's important. That's why I was asking, especially about like the contract before, because all those fees should be laid out um, at the very beginning so that we as, as owners know what we're kind of getting ourselves into yeah. and then would understand, especially with the condition of our property, um, what, what, what that would look like. Yep. You had mentioned earlier that your team will also do preventative maintenance tasks. Mm-hmm. Can you share a little bit more about what those would include or what those look like? Uh, yeah, so we can go out and do a preventative maintenance semi-annual inspection okay. for a fee if you choose to, if you elect to do that. Uh, uh-huh. We'll also change out your air filter, but we'll you know, do a full walkthrough on the inside of your property and the exterior. We'll take photos. We've got an app that is a, basically an inspection app. Now I'll say, hey, it looks like uh, you're getting some wood rot under this window and there was leaking uh, underneath your sink. We recommend that you repair these items before they get any worse. Mm-hmm. That's that's what something like that would look like. Gotcha. And that would be the same as as for if I was self-managing and chose to go do quarterly inspections or mm-hmm. semi-annual inspection. That's exactly what I would be looking for. Yeah. And we've all been in situations, as you kind of mentioned, one of the things that's really important is for tenants to tell you when something goes wrong. Yeah, I get it. Even with even with self managing, it's much more difficult when all of a sudden they're like, "Oh yeah, that's just been leaking for the past, you know, past six months," and you're and you're the one paying the water, and you're like, "Oh, that would have been helpful information. Like I would have mm-hmm. preferred that like on day two of a leak, not on day 182 of that leak." According so, to our lease, that goes back to the that a lot of that cost will go back to the tenant. Oh yeah, it'll go back to the tenant, but it's still my problem to fix. Yeah, but so. then, but any of the damage that's resulted, that'll go back to the tenant as well. Because if you yeah. don't report an issue, then you're might as well be responsible. Your, yeah, exactly. Um, so now, what if you are not you, not your company, but what if I, as a seller, am now working with property manager that is just not a good fit? They, I made the wrong decision. They ended up not having that software. I'm not getting the answers that I kind of need. They're not giving me the options for anything preventative maintenance. So I'm just always getting bills for just more and more things coming through and no one's telling me why, what they're about, anything like that. How do I move forward from basically kind of breaking up in that relationship? Hmm. Well, that's great. (laughs) Uh, We work uh, with a lot on the breakup side um, with Mm -hmm. owners coming to us. Um, Nobody's ever going to be happy 100% of the time. So we do occasionally have owners break up with us. That's just the reality of any business. No, you're not going to, not every customer is going to be happy, uh, mm. but you have a property management agreement. It is a contract. There mm. are expectations, performance that is outlined in that, that if you don't, you know, you have to do these things. And if they're not doing these things, then there should be a breakup clause in there that says, hey, if there's non-performance by manager on any of these items, then with a 30-day written notice, the contract can be terminated prior to the end date. Now, a mm-hmm. lot of contracts will also say, hey, if you're trying to break this contract ahead of the, the, the end date, you have to pay us the equivalent amount of the fees we would have collected from current date through the end, mm-hmm. unless there was a non-performance issue. So I would read through that PMA, the property management agreement, and say, okay, where, where do they non-perform at? And then send them a well-written or worded letter or mm-hmm. email. It doesn't mm-hmm. have to be hostile, right? It can be professional um, and say, hey, you know, um, according to the contract, you were supposed to have our things done by this date and they didn't. And, mm-hmm. you know, three months in a row, your proper, uh, you know, your profit and loss statements were out, uh, you know, a week later than you, they were supposed to be. That's non-performance. I'd like to terminate my lease now. Here's my new property or, you know, terminate my agreement. Here's the new manager. Please contact them for a smooth and professional transition. <laughs> if somebody like asks me and they're like, Hey, I want to be out of my contract. I'll say, okay, great. Just tell me where to give the, I'm not going to fight them at the end of the day. I mean, the contract is in force and I could enforce it if I want to, but mm-hmm. I gain nothing by fighting an owner to stay in a property management agreement. Well, that's also, I mean, in a very similar way, that's also forcing a tenant that wants to, that wants out of their lease, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's 
no, no, you have to, you have to stay in your lease, right? You have to fulfill your agreement, but like they can make your life like absolutely hard. Yeah, so, absolutely. I don't, I don't want to deal with that. And you know, if, if a tenant or a, an owner is unhappy with a service, if I let them go amicably, probably no big deal. Everybody's happy. If I fight them tooth and nail, that's when you're going to get nasty reviews online. That's when you're going to get sued, sued. or sent to the Better <laughs> Business Bureau or something like that. And it's like, you know what? If you feel like I suck that much, then that's fine. Go on. You know, exactly. We can we can find a new tenant. Um, I can work to develop relationships with new owners. Um, yeah. Know, and, and that's okay. That's okay. Because nobody's ever going to be a great fit. Now, do you feel that more owners have been coming to you throughout this pandemic and eviction moratorium since you do services dealing with evictions um, or that people have more headaches that you feel that they don't necessarily want to deal with? I, I thought that was really interesting that that your that your company would actually t- go through that whole conviction like, and that the landlord would not be included since the lease is well, not in my name. Yeah, the property manager is always going to handle the eviction process for you mm-hmm. unless you want to step in because you feel like some reason, but the tenant has a lease with you for the property manager to, or for the owner or landlord to jump into that eviction process, we would have to then assign the lease to them. And I'm still going to have to be involved because I've got all the payment history. I've got all whatever history for the reason for the eviction. So yeah, I mean, we manage the process. We engage the attorney. We pass the attorney fee on to you. Uh, We're Mm -hmm. not going to absorb your $500 to $1,000 attorney bill. Um, But you know, then we'll, (laughs) we'll go to court and we'll get your unit back and then we'll go from there. So and, That's great. you know, uh, well over 90% of the evictions that we do are tenants that we inherit, not tenants that we place. That's exactly. That's where I was kind of getting at because I feel like right now, like more people are like, you know what, through this, I can get somebody else to manage my property and then to evict my tenant. I'm going to go with that property manager. Now, maybe I wasn't planning on going property management, but maybe now this is something that I would want to do. <laughs> um, especially if they've been, if somebody, especially if somebody has been kind of struggling Uh, with their tenants throughout throughout this pandemic let me tell you becky it is august of 2021 right now and Mm -hmm. i am cdc just kicked us in the butt again by giving us Mm -hmm. another 90 days to the tenants and i am so over that that's a whole (laughs) political tirade that we could get on uh, but it is it's it's unfair first to the property owners because they Mm -hmm. have a mortgage to pay it's unfair second to the property managers because if we're not collecting rent Unless our lease is written, or unless our PMA is written on flat fee, no matter what, it's all based upon percent of rent collected. So I am still expending resources to, to manage that property and nobody's given us our money back. Nobody's given the owners the money back either. No, and honestly, I, that's actually an interesting point you kind of bring up because you do clearly, you know, there's this tenants versus landlords kind of battle brewing, if you will. And it does tend to be like, well, are the landlords going to get paid back? Are the landlords going to get their money back? And fine, there are certain avenues that say, it seems like they're probably going to take years to be able to get your rental system from mm-hmm. certain states. Um, I'm in New York. We don't exactly move very quickly over here bureaucratically. Um, but that's also true. Now, you as a property manager are still managing those properties, are still having to go out, work with that rent collection, work with those tenants. And yet you're then also not collecting the fees that you deserve and that you, that you should be getting as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And very well, these tenants huh. might be making income. And just choosing not to pay their rent. I mean, that's what they're at now. They're just choosing not to pay their rent. And um, it's, uh, you know, I know some people are still affected by this pandemic and I want to be as empathetic as possible. But when I have a tenant that's refusing to sign government paperwork to where we could get all their back rent for six months yeah. paid and they just don't want to because it's inconvenient for them, that that grinds Correct. my gears, Becky. <laughs> no, we are absolutely not <laughs> discussing the people that are really in need that are still to work and been incredibly mm-hmm. impacted with the pandemic. There are landlords and tenants that have completely struggled throughout this whole thing and property managers that have. Yes. There's there's no denying that there are people still in very bad places at this current time due to this pandemic. But yeah. there are also people that are taking advantage of them. And those are the people that we are speaking about. That's the people that we are speaking about. Oh, just that it is, it is very difficult. Yeah, exactly. it's very difficult. And it's... Um, it's unfair to all, all parties involved, um, you know, and it's, we're not in to go back to an earlier, we're not teaching the tenants to fish. Now they're just, they're just giving them a fish and they're just, just riding it out. Exactly. Well, let's, let's hope by the time this episode comes out that people will be listening to me like, oh yeah, August, 2021, that was crazy. But now a few months later, we're 
tenants, landlords, property managers, everybody is hopefully in some a little bit of a better situation. So to kind of wrap up here, let's let's end on a little bit of a positive. Note, right? Absolutely. So can you run me down the best questions? And I know we kind of touched on this throughout the interview. So now I just mm-hmm. kind of want to pull them all together and kind of compile it here. In our last few minutes here, can you just give, run through the couple questions that I as an owner should ask a property manager when I call to kind of interview them. We already said I am asking for references and I'm going to look online and learn a little bit about them before I call you. But when I call you, what are the top three, four questions that I should be asking you to see if I want to work with you? Uh, References. Mm -hmm. Um, Does the type of property I am looking to acquire or already own fit into the type of property that you manage, both asset type and geography? I like Um, that. Yeah. Uh, ask how they do their operations and who is my person that I go to if I have a question and who's my escalation person. And that also goes with the software system that we kind of talked about. Like, how are they mm-hmm. keeping track of things? How would our communication? Yeah. Like? Yeah. And then, you know, how are your, you know, how do you guys bill or, you know, track your maintenance? Cause that's a cost that can, that can run out. And the last question you should ask, this isn't your first question is what's your fee? Because the amount of fee on your general monthly management is going to vary just a couple of percent at most. And if Mm -hmm. that fee difference makes or breaks your asset, you probably don't have the best asset or you need to reevaluate if that's the one that you want to purchase. Um, Because you you can fire a PM after six months if they're, you don't feel like you're getting the fee, you know, the value for it, but you can't sell that property at a gain. (laughs) You're going to, you're going to come out on the back end of that. So you know, if you're like, well, this guy over here was going to give me 7%, but you're saying 8% or whatever it is. And they're yeah. like, uh, Hey, you know, that's, that's not the, that's not the question that you want to ask. Um, because you want to make sure you're getting the best PM possible. Uh, I had a guy ask me if I could cut 3% off my fee. And I was like, no, cause that's less than I charge myself. So yeah. <laughs> I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to do that. I mean, I charge myself the same rates that I charge everybody. Yeah. No, and that makes sense. And once again, we kind of talked about this earlier too. You are an expert in what you do and we should be paying for that. I could not imagine going to my accountant and being like, hey, how about we cut your fee in half? You yeah, know? I mean, when you tell um, me that you want to go from- Or my attorney. Yeah, you want to <laughs> go from 9% to 8%, you know, you're asking me to take over, you know, you're taking a, an 11%, 12% cut off my fee. You're going to exactly. go to your attorney and be like, well, I know you want to bill me, you know, in New York, it's probably, I don't even want to guess the number, but around here- you know, <laughs> Three fifty, five hundred dollars an hour. Oh, hey, can you just take that down to you know, four fifty, four twenty five for me? They're just gonna say yeah. no, take it or leave it. And you know, exactly. we'd like to think that we provide the value, and um, that's why we are we're not at the top of the market with the fee. But um, mm-hmm. you know, that shouldn't be your biggest focus. No, and same thing. I know a lot of landlords would not would not be very happy if a tenant came to them and said, "Hey, I know you're asking, you know, a thousand dollars in rent, but I would really prefer to pay six hundred we mm-hmm. probably, we, that would probably not be our first choice of tenants. So yeah. also same thing. We need to be able to treat other, other professions the same way that we expect to be treated as well. And realize that you're providing a service, which is incredibly beneficial to us as landlords. Yeah. So Colin, thank you very much for being on today and filling us in a little bit about how we can best work with property managers. I will make sure to put the links down in our show notes for anybody in the Kansas city market or in St. Louis and some of the other cities that you'll be opening up with. So that way they can reach out to you with any further questions on Atlas Property Management. Um, Anything else you would like to kind of add today before we wrap up? No, I really appreciate that you had me on. I think it's awesome what you're doing with Lady Landlords. And if any of them have any questions about property management, even if it's not in a market that we're in, uh, my job is to be a resource uh, for investors. So please feel free to reach out to me. I'll be glad glad to help you out in any way that I can. Great. Thank you very much, Colin. And for any of you lady landlords out there that are listening, if you need a little bit of extra help with growing your portfolio, make sure to also check the link down below for the Lady Landlords Roadmap, which gives you a step-by-step plan exactly on how you can build your portfolio to financial freedom. So thank you very much for listening in, and I will see you all next week on our next episode of the Lady Landlords Podcast.